Okay, uh, welcome to Six Scale. It's March 10th. Put the meeting notes in chat. Have yourself an attendee, please. Okay, um, the first thing is just an announcement. Um, uh, next, the next meeting that will be scheduled for, for Six Scale will be April 7th. Um, so three weeks from now. Um, so I'll be, I'm going to be out of office for three weeks. So this will be the, the next time I'll be back. So um, let me actually, when double check, I said April 7th, one, two, three, no, 30, 30. No, no, it's the seventh. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I'll be back uh, in the office on uh, in the beginning of April. So yeah, April 7th is right. So um, I'll put something on the mailing list again as a, just as a reminder, but that's when we'll, we'll meet again. Okay. Um, some PRs. So I want to get to a, a few of these. Um, first one is, so I brought this up a few times. I just want to decide on the fate of this PR here. Um, see what people want to do with this one. Uh, we could either, I mean, I, it's been here for a little while. Like we've had a little bit of review on it. Um, I mean, do people feel comfortable merging this as is, or should I just mark this as work in progress? And, you know, we spend time you know, with our tests and our test framework and we build out this this PR over time, like, is there any preference for that? Or, um, you know, do we do we want to just merge it now? Or like, I mean, what do people think? Yeah, I think it should be fine. And if we want to update it later, we can, you know, just update. Okay. All right, I'll have to ask, uh, I'll get some, Get David to, to act it then. Okay. All right. That's fine. We'll go with that. Um, okay. Second one, um, the load generator. Um, I wanted to just spend a minute or two on this because I did make another change to this. Um, I changed the interfaces a little bit um, to make this even, uh, I think, a little bit more friendly for different types of um, jobs that we could add. So what I did was um, originally is I designed um, a few interfaces, let me see, uh, for for a job. I call it, uh, actually, I originally was in load generator, but I, now I call it a job. So these are the things that I consider to be anything that we need to, um, to manage any type of workload. I'm thinking that eventually we, what we could do is we could allow different types of jobs to override this stuff like, um, like I could see different types of steady state jobs that have different types of um, that sort of handle that have uh, that handle like the refill differently or something um, or delete differently, um, and so we can override these things. And then the interface for actually doing these things, I just reuse it with a run and delete, and that's it. Um, so I changed the API so that it's a little bit. Um, I think it's a little bit easier to use um, based on my previous change, and then. Um, the other change I added is uh, the, let's see here, it's in steady state. It's just the min turn sleep. So this is just a, um, the, all this is is a, a, um, the amount, a configurable amount of time that we're gonna wait, um, like that wait, the wait API that I just highlighted. Um, for every, every time we do this, uh, let me see if I can find steady state. It's easier to show this. Steady state. Yeah, here. So, so every time like we go through, right? Like, so we go through iteration. The my expectation is that we'll we'll do some sort of wait in between, um, you know, the creates and deletes, and this could be um, any value that, and it also could vary quite a bit. Like, I mean, wait could be, um, you could do something in wait. I mean, for for all we know based on how we want to run this job. But um, I, I simply just have it as a configurable. I think this is just something that I think generally people will want to use. So I have a, a min sleep turn sleep duration. So what it'll do is it'll calculate the amount of time spent creating and it'll subtract it um, to uh, any, like say it took uh, 20 seconds to do create and I set my min turn sleep to 30 seconds it'll then sleep for the remainder of that time so 10 seconds so that'll give us just a little bit of a buffer between create and deletes but if they're if we're creating like up 
up until you know the point that we needed to delete, then that's fine. That's fine as well. Um, and so if you really wanted to have control over this, you could set this you know value to be very high if you wanted to have you know some sort of sleep in between um, during the periods of churn. So it's configurable. I think that's I think that'll be a better um, interface for testing. So that was the second change I made. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I've been doing some testing with this internally. Um, so far, um, so far, so good. Um, I still want. I still have some ideas how to expand it, but um, uh, but yeah, so far I think, so far I like it. I want to. Um, I'll, I'll eventually take this and uh, expand this to one of your like what you have right now with the what we have right now with the burst job. Um, I'd like to include it as a periodic. Um, but I want to get to the right, uh, I think once I have the right um, configuration, because um, I, I haven't tested this at like the same scale that we'd run that job at. So I want to make sure that um, I configure this correctly. So I don't have that yet. Once I do, I'll, I'll make the change to the periodic uh, to add it or to add a steady state. But yeah, here's what the results look like. Um, yeah, you can see like we get this study create. This is with a um, a churn of two, so we create five, we delete two, we recreate two, delete two, we create two over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Well, if uh, so, I mean, the only thing I wanted to just bring attention to is those, those changes. But um, Marcelo, you're the one who's mostly reviewed this. But if you have any other comments, let me know. Um, yeah, but I think I, uh, I think it's mostly ready. Yeah, the only thing that I I, I think I comment is you know some hard code parameters. Okay. So I really think that we should avoid hard code things. So if we have flags, maybe you know, um, and uh, if you don't want to make it, you know, configurable in the YAML, maybe have a flag. You know, I don't know. So I'm just against yeah, my, hard coded parameters. So it's yeah, my, my it's not a good this, practice, I would think. So. Yeah, my thought for this, Marcel, is that, um, well, like a, I wanted to find a value that is not likely to change. Like I understand what you're, what you're saying, like with the, some tests I want to make it different. That's totally fair. But the um, if we set this to, to like certain values, like I expect that majority of tests will not change them. And, and that's kind of what I wanted to do. Like with 20, it seems fairly reasonable that it's not going to change, but I, I totally respect that it could. And what I want to see if like, if we get to that use case, you know, then maybe what we do is we increase this value. Or if, if we find that like the use case is that we constantly need to change this on tests because like, you know, we've done a number of tests and we see a huge difference based on cluster size and other things. Then yeah, I, I think it makes sense to be as a parameter, but I mean, overall, like, I guess what I'm saying is that like, I think much, most cases will be okay with, with this, you know? Yeah, so that's that's defined to have a default parameter. You know, it's like, for example, if you don't set it and it to get the default one, but I don't like to have it like hard coded 20, you know, especially because I think the global, you know, configuration should be unlimited, you know, zero, for example. So, it's it should have rate limiting when you know when an interval between creations, but the 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 client itself, you know, um, should uh, sh should not have like rate limits because if you do, for example, we are not doing list, but if you do list or get or mm -hmm. anything, it shouldn't get any rate limit for the you know benchmark standpoint. I, I think. So um, that's why, you know, in the beginning, it, I have this global configuration and also the job configuration rate limit. Uh, the global configuration is for the, you know, the client in general. So actually by default was using zero. So no rate limit for, you know, for all the requests. However, between creations, we can control, you know, the rate of, create requests or delete requests. And then we have another rate limit for this kind of, you know, uh, um, you know, 
requests. So that rate so, limit is like, that's on the, it's enforced by the client, right? Like we're gonna, like if we make requests too quickly, it's just gonna, the client is gonna rate limit us. That's what this is getting at. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so we, like a two, two kind of level. So one is the, the client goal rate limit. So this one, I think, you know, by default, we shouldn't make it unlimit. So no rate limit for that. However, there is another limit between the requests. I think I had some waiters. Uh, I was using the, the library rate limit actually to put some weight between creations. So then in this case, I could configure, for example, you know, 20 requests, 20 create requests per second or 10 create requests per second. I had some uh, some logic about that before, so I don't remember if I don't remember if you changed that or not. I'm just thinking because now that you remove this global configuration, and then you put twenty here, and then it will impact you know everything you know not only create but uh, you know in all the requests. So it's get, list, and whatever will be also rate limit with twenty, and. And then if you run things also, you know, I'm just thinking that in the in the global case. So if you, for example, run two jobs in parallel, they will also be rate limit with 20 between themselves. Um, and the, the, so the, that's why I think the client shouldn't have rate limit, but you can have, uh, you know, control the creations per second in the, in the, in the code, so that's insane. So you're saying this should be this should be zero, and then I should rate limit like between um, with some other mechanism in um, like when we're actually going through and doing the creates. Like after each create, I should have something to rate limit between yeah. them. Yeah. Actually, that's that's how Kubern is also doing. So, mm -hmm. and I, I think other other tools are doing some similar things. So. Hmm. So like in that in that case, um... in the case you 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 can make the default value as zero or maybe you know can I I still think that can be configurable, but anyway, I think it should be the default zero for the global you know client configuration, and and then it should have some control for creations for deletes. And you have a control for updates for, for, you know, for the steady state, you kind of have this control with slips. So, but you, there is a library, you know, that you have, uh, it's called rate limiter. So, and then you just configure like also burst and curse per second. And then you do the, some weight. I thought I implement that in the original load generator, but I'm not sure now. So if, if you didn't if you didn't see that, maybe it's not, was not that there. I don't yeah, I, um, okay. Yeah, like I did, yeah, I see what you mean. Like I do do it with weights. Um, uh, yeah, it is a good question, kind of how the interface should look. Um, but it's like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like it's, um, I don't know. This just seems like a, a, a an easy way to do it. I, I I can look into it, but I mean, I think um I think though I think I agree with you that this should be zero. Like I guess we shouldn't we shouldn't rate limit at all here. It's it's zero, right? That you said it's not like negative one or something. I, I can look this up. But whatever I think, the I think whatever it's zero, the, but yeah, it's just zero, zero is no limit. Yeah, no limit. I guess that makes sense. Okay, so yeah, I could do zero for this, and then we could um yeah, then um I'll leave. So how I think like I think I guess so my approach Marcelo is that like I, I just wanted to want I kind of want us to try and like I want to see how this goes like because it seemed like um it, it's fairly basic like what I have I think what so I'll make this zero and then I mean the sleep kind of works but I mean I, I totally acknowledge that there could be a better way like we could I kind of want to revisit that though I think um okay if we can make it more powerful I definitely want to revisit it as we, I, I kind of want to let it evolve, like as we kind of build the, the use cases as we use it more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll change this to zero and then um, I, I completely agree with that. Okay. Sounds good. 
Okay. Cool. Uh, okay, and then here's the, I, I wrote the config to go with it, Marcelo. Um, mm -hmm. I forget if I CC you, I did, okay. Yeah, this is, and I added Daniel too. So um, yeah, when you get a chance, this will, this will go with it for, that'll make it work with just the same way that you have now with your burst test. Yeah, it looks good. So when the other one gets merged, we can, I, I won't hold this one, so. Okay, sounds good. Okay, um, so the other thing that I had for this meeting, I wanted to do a little design because, so one of the things that we've talked about, um, and we've talked about this tool, we generate, we, uh, we generate load, we've talked about a tool we have, you know, we audit. Um, the other part we, you know, we've, we've kind of talked about is like, you know, how can we measure, like how we could, how can we measure pressure has been like our, that question, that larger question. And um, you know, we talked about it with this, within this presentation. And, um, and kind of the way I wanted to think about this is like, what's the first thing we could do, like, you know, when we approach this problem? And I'm thinking, you know, we, we need to answer the question, like, how do we measure a cluster's pressure at, at rest? Like, before we test, we need to know a certain things right about the cluster. Like, we need to know how many nodes it has, how many nodes, um, how many nodes it has, how many. Um, how many other things that, that has that could be causing pressure so that when we do tests, we know the difference, like we know how much pressure that, that we're causing, um, you know, with our workload. Um, and it's, does that make sense to people, like kind of as a way to, to measure, like, so basically what this would do is like, this would give us a way to understand, um, like when someone is running our tool with load generation and auditing, you know, when they're telling us, here's what our scale is, we understand um, what their their topology is, their cluster topology is, so that we can put the topology against the numbers and understand, you know, what what their scale or their performance actually means. Yeah, I'm not sure if I if I got it. So, you mean to visualize the data, to analyze the data, because, for example. You have a cluster, you know, 100 nodes, and then you create some pressure. For example, you want to do a burst test, create 1,000 VMs, mm -hmm. or the steady state in that you configure in the way that you configure. For example, creating 500 and with a churn of 20, and and then you do this analysis, which means, and then you check the for example, you need to check the, some SLO, for example, the VM creation time. Um, if you see, you know, this, uh, the, the, the creation time is too high, you need to decrease the pressure because such, this kind of pressure, the cluster doesn't hold. So, and, but I don't know what kind of topology, you know, the, the benchmark tool should analyze. I, I just think that it should be like many tests and then someone goes check the, the data and see if the pressure is high or not. So it can be like, uh, you know, the, the latency of creation time or throughput, how many VMs you can actually create um, because there is a limit. Isn't it? Yeah. So what um, I'm worried about is like, so say we want to publish SLOs, right? We say that in release 051, 051, we, this is what the SLO is like. We expect you to be able to do a thousand, you know, VM start to create or create to running time in less than, um, I don't know, each VM with less than 20 seconds on average or something. You know, that's our SLO. And um, you know, someone run, does goes and runs this in their in their data center, and they don't hit the SLO. And you know, why why didn't they hit it? Well, maybe they had hundred thousand PVCs just sitting there. Maybe they had a thousand namespaces. You know, it, like their topology is totally different than what we're testing in. So their SLO is totally different. So it's it's almost it's not even a fair it's not a fair comparison. So yeah, you know, I've, is I've... it. I don't remember now, but I think Kubernetes in their documentation, they don't put numbers also. So we, they just describe what is the SLO. For example, the VM creation time. And then we describe what is that. 
VM creation times is the VM is in the running state, which means the running state is, you know, libvirt domain got created and then received the uh, run command, things like that, you know. So um, we described scenarios. We don't need to say, oh, the VM should be 10, you know, less than one minute, something like the creation time, because it varies a lot. So yeah. especially because different than, different than pods, the VMs creation times linearly, you know, increase linearly with the number of VMs. So uh, if we, we have more VMs, you know, a, a, a batch of more VMs burst, a burst of 110,000, you know, VMs, the worst case scenario, some VMs will be like a, is lower because they are, you know, uh, waiting the work queues, things like that. So, um, and there are, of course, there are much more things behind the scene that slow down the VM creation, but is um, we cannot, right now we cannot guarantee. And also we should not guarantee in our official documentation. So we can just say what you should consider, you know, regarding regard latency you know in the, in the official document so if we have some report you know for example nvidia report i don't know red hat ibm report and in the report we say okay these these are the numbers that we measure you know in our environment and then it should be fine but in the official doc, you know the in the official you know in the github and the official documentation of um, uh, Kubvert, I think we should not put numbers because especially because of the thing you said, the hardware will change a lot, the size of the cluster, the number of VMs being created. Um, we can Marcello, double check now. Marcello, yeah. just one question here. I did not hear everything, so you may have answered it already. Would it, wouldn't it still make sense to kind of come up with some numbers or the hardware we have to say this is what we want to have and this is not a regression so to just see if we have on known hardware regressions you you know in the yeah so it can be a discussion so i was just thinking like uh, in this ryan was saying when we describe about the slos okay so and okay. then in the document that we describe about the slos I don't think we should put numbers here there. So we should just say what is the SLOs and and then you know how we can we can measure that. And then later, as I, I was comment, I don't know, I, you, you guys can disagree with that, it's fine. So and then for example, if we have the Kubvert blog, and then we describe what we see in our Kubvert CI, for example, you know, in the hardware that we have, the SLOs that we define what's the numbers that we see or some other experiments that we can, we might run, you know, we can report that as a kind of a report, but we don't, maybe we don't need to say the official numbers, like, uh, you know, in our SLO document, document and say, okay, the VM should, you know, creating a VM should be, you know, lower than this, this number here, because I think it's hard to, to to, you know, to say that, but well, again, in a blog or in a report, it should be fine. Yeah, I understand that you're saying. I, I mean, I guess like what I'm saying is that I, I, I'm think I'm thinking like theoretically that it might be possible because if assuming this theory that we can measure, assuming the theory that we can measure a cluster's pressure, like if we can quantify it. If we're able to quantify it, then like that should be a, a consistent number that like I could put, I could say like our CI system has, for instance, this measurable amount of pressure right at, at rest, like the moment we run our tests. So this is the what we'd expect within some plus or minus range for performance. And this is, you know, what like this is what you should, this is what you should get. And, and that would give us, that would give us a lot of confidence. Now, now that would be very similar to, I think what you're saying, which is like the value, if like, if, for example, if we were to just say in our CI, here's how, what the performance we respect, uh, uh, expect. 
I, I would say it's sort of the same, it's the same thing as that, except when someone goes and runs, someone else in another outside of, you know, the CI environment wants to run um, one, this performance or load generation test and audit tool and, and do a performance test, they're going to see different numbers, right? So what's going to change? Well, the only thing that we could give them to tell what's changed is, is a measure of their pressure at rest so that they can know that, okay, their cluster is different. Here's how it's different. And so we, if we know that we could, we could, we might be able to estimate what their expected pressure would, would be within some range. If, you know, if, if we had that number, that, that's all I'm saying. Like, so in other words, like, instead of saying, instead of like just documenting what we, you know, we, what we've tested, I'm saying we might be able to, we might be able to provide a way for other people to estimate for themselves what they're, you know, not just like, you know, like what they should expect instead of just like having to run the test like a hundred times and, you know, we might be able to estimate this. Do you follow me at all? Or do you disagree with that or? I, it's it's a little no. bit more difficult. Like I, I would say it's more difficult because like I think it's the same thing. It, it solves the same problem that you're saying, which is like we want to have a number that we could say our CI currently the performance we expect with our CI, but we could also say we could also estimate other different forms of performance based on you know pressure. We could get we could gather data like that. Like for instance, if we found. Like, so say internally NVIDIA had like some high pressure, so it's totally different CI. We could, it, it might provide more justification to the performance that we're seeing, which might be totally different than CI. And it might just be that because, okay, our performance, our profession, our pressure number is higher. So our performance number is lower or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just another metric, I guess. Yeah, so I, I get it. So you want to have like some baseline. Yeah, I think a baseline is fine. So I'm just, you know, I think we are not, maybe, you know, we are not ready yet to have baselines. You know, um, in, but it, it should be fine if we create a, a report and uh, a blog, you know, you know, showing this results. But to put like, uh, you know, what's the target pressure that we want to have, mm -hmm. um, especially because, in, especially in the CI is very small. So yeah. we, we can even say about scalability there. So, you know, uh, we can say about some performance, um, but um, yeah. Like another sure, way so. to think about this, Marcel, is like, let's say we could, um, what if we, for example, like I, this, this would be actually good to test in CI. And I, this could actually like, I mean, I think this would help this theory is that if we are to test consistently on their CI, you know, how we do now, like clean cluster, right? We get the same results. It would be interesting to modify that test where we would apply pressure, for example, like create our environment and then create 10,000 PVCs and namespaces and stuff like just create all sorts of chaos and then run the test and then take a look at this. And, and it would be interesting because this would be an interesting point on a graph because now we can graph pressure against performance, right? Like now we can put those points in a line. Whereas if we don't do that, then we're, what we're doing is we're, we're just putting, um, we're, we're sort of graphing and we're just, we're just putting numbers out there. We're saying, okay, this is, here's what we see in CI. Here's what you expect, but we're not comparing it against anything, you know? Like, so we could do this actually, we could test this in CI as well. Like we could test the pressure. I think it's just, it's just a wider, it's just more things we could test. You know? I test the pressure in the CI. So it was my, you know, I did a presentation in the Fosding, um, you know, to create like, for example, what's the, maximum number of VMs that we can create with mm -hmm. the tiny VMs. For example, um, I could create, a, you know, 500, you know, VMs per node. Okay, yeah. we have only three nodes, but it was like a big pressure, was very slow with 500, you know, right. it reached some limits. It was right. a huge pressure. So that was the maximum. But it was like VMs without PVCs, you know, with just ephemeral containers. Things can get like a more, 
um, you know, uh, we, we can have a lot of tests to do things. But I think the CI goal here is, okay, so we have the set of tests that we run and we want to keep them to see how the code evolves. You know, deep performance evaluation, I think should be in some other system. You know what I mean? So the CI, we have this test, it, the results that we have there, we can understand that as a baseline, especially to compare how it evolves with the code because people are changing the code and we need to, now we have like, we, net, we have a way to verify if the performance is being impacted or not, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but to find, you know, the limits that you are comment now, this is something, for example, we, we do that, you know, we're doing that, this kind of testing internally in Red Hat, but it's, uh, and then we can find another, maybe some cluster or even some of this data, if it's possible to publish, you know, um, and make it public, uh, then we can, you know, write a blog or, you know, create a report saying what is the limits, what we, what's the pressure that we see, you know, and then that I'm saying, I think this is kind of analysis for some deep performance evaluation in a specific cluster, but the CI shouldn't have this deep performance evaluation with the extremely stressed tests, you know. Um, it should be like a, something that, some tests that it, we can reproduce and see how the code evolves. Well, that's what's interesting to me is that is that it might be reproducible. Like that's what, like you saw, right? When you did your your pressure tests, you probably saw that like that 500th VM on the node, it was consistently slow, right? It was not unexpectedly fast, you know, when it was always slow. Like that, that's what I'm saying. It's like defining those expectations. And and that mm -hmm. if you're if they're predictable, if those are predictable, then we might be able to measure them in such a way that. And this just like in the way that um, you know we're measuring at low pressure, um, so because, because honestly, like sometimes things like code changes can have an effect, have no effect at low pre low pressure, right? But they could have an effect at higher pressure. So there's like there is like testing the extremes might not be a bad idea. Like we might find things that are different with this type of test. But really, the whole thing that's important here is that is it predictable? Like that's the question. Like can we predict what is going to happen, you know, based on the pressure. And I, I think like just from some anecdotal evidence, just by your testing, I've, I've seen it myself. Um, I mean, I think even this presentation talks about it, that, you know, that you can predict it, like you can predict it is predictably slow, but I mean, is it quantifiable? Like, can we, can we put it to a mathematical equation that we can actually measure it and plot it? Um, and then if we can, then we could measure it and, and we could test both extremes because we might get different results based on code changes. So it may be useful in CI just for, just for that reason. Yeah. Do, you, do you agree or disagree? Well, I think too much pressure can break the cluster and the CI, if we break it, it will be hard to recover. So I'm just saying like, we need to be careful with the kind of test that we put there. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, and for right now, we have a test that it's, I think it's already, you know, with a lot of stress, if I create 600 VMs, it's a small cluster, three nodes only, and it's creating 600 VMs, with 200 per node. Um, it's uh, officially, you know, I think officially, you know, uh, OpenShift, it's, I think it's, official 250 VMs, which were recommended or something like that. Yeah. So I think 200, 200 VMs per node, it's already like a very high. And uh, we have this test and it's is low. So we, if we compare, you know, 600 VMs uh, against creating 100. So uh, I don't remember now the, the exactly times, but um, let me check here. I have so 100 VM is less than one minute. Okay, 
when we have like 600 VMs, we reach the, sometimes we reach the 10, the 10 minutes. And, you know, execution. Okay. In fact, in fact, um, yeah, let me, sh actually, let me share my screen so you can see that. Or I'll stop share. Oh, yeah. oh, hopefully it will be working. <laughs> you know, if this thing that we do. This. It's loading, but anyway, we can see that. Uh, can you can you guys see? It? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, it's for some reason it's, it's super slow now. You know, um, might be my internet. I don't know. Anyway, so this uh, oh, I don't know what is this. Okay, you know the this is the the zoom. Panel is here. So probably you guys are not seeing this whole panel. Anyway, so we can see here the VM creation time. These are many tasks. Mm -hmm. Some old executions, they were, you know, reaching to up to 10 minutes, but later, so just, just see the, the first graph, you know, yep. in the upper. Yeah. And then later they start to be like five minutes, you know, the worst case scenario. So Something changed in the code that make it better. And uh, I actually, I'm planning to write maybe a blog about these results or something that I will try to do like later. I didn't have the time, but I will do that. Um, oh, it's updated. Huh. So you saw, but you saw that it was an improvement at uh... It was noticeable, like when you did it when, at this amount of pressure, like there was a noticeable improvement. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so, and then we see like it's been created like a the worst case scenario. It's like, uh, you know, five minutes. And yeah, actually not five, eight minutes. So, uh, okay, we can see here. There are some spikes. You see some, some variations. Yeah. Um, and the no what is these variations, um, something that you analyze also. Uh, the, uh, it, we don't, the tests here are not all the same because sometimes we run the test creating only 100 VMIs and the other time we range, you know, 200, 400 and up to 600 VMI creation. Uh, yeah, we're not sure if we can say that was a performance improvement here because there is there is some variation. We need to, to check that more, you know, longer term to see if we can trust, you know, these improvements or not. Any, yeah. Anyway, so if we see here, for example, when we are creating 600 VMs, it's taking in the, you know, worst case scenario here, isn't eight minutes. So it's very high, isn't it? So, um, we, I think we already, you know, see some uh, pressure here. Uh, of course, we can reach even further limit, like create 1,000 maybe, because I think the cluster is fine. So it's up to 1,000. More than 1,000, it doesn't create. It actually breaks. So reach some limits, if I, as far as I know. Huh. Uh, you know, before, you know, enabling the jobs, I was trying to do this, um, you know, performance analysis. Um, I, I have it, you know, documents for that. It should be open. I will open this and then we will share this again. It was a long time that I did this, doc this documentation anyway. So, um, I mean, it was like a, for creating more than 1,000, I think it was reaching some limit, but I don't remember now which limit it was reaching. And, but we can, you know, theoretically we can create 500, 400 per node. So it was, oh yes, we can create 1,200, maximum 1,200. But with 400, 
it's uh, it's already put a lot of pressure because okay. it's it's creating too many pods per node, so it's another limit. You know, we we reach a we we start to see a limit of number of VMs per node, and not really you know a limit of uh, number of VMs that we can create in the cluster. You know, if we have more nodes, it would be more a fair, you know, uh, analysis, I would say, because it's the, the kubelet start to be overload. The, you know, the, con the container runtime start to be overload because it's creating too much containers. And then we start to have another bottlenecks, you know, yep. and it's not the kubevert bottlenecks. That I, that, that's what I'm saying. So up to 1,000, I think, should be fine in this cluster that we have. And do not see other bottlenecks that is not related to kubevert that I'm saying. And, uh, and then we can analyze, you know, uh, um, metrics, um, especially the kubevert work queue. I saw, you know, something that it's interesting. Um, I don't remember now what was my conclusion here, but yeah, so anyway, so I want to point that, yeah, we have this virtual controller node. It should be, you know, have maybe less pressure now because there are some PRs maybe that will affect this to reduce the number of get, this kind of things. Um, and then we, we might be interesting if we just PRs get merged, we can see, you know, things like, things here in the Kubernetes CI. You know, you know, like you're saying with like keyword pressure, it would be interesting to see if we're within the, the range that Kubernetes expects, right, with, with pods. Um, like what, because like you said, if we're just loading onto nodes, like Kubernetes already knows that that's that's a lot of pressure. Um, so yeah, we we expect like we expect what you're seeing, right? Yeah, like and 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 so, mm -hmm. do we know like um, like do we know like I guess what I would see or would be interesting to see is like, um, if we're in a, you know, if we have I don't know how, I forget how many nodes, three nodes or whatever, and if you if you're loading it to you know three hundred or something. Um, you know, what would the, what would your expected performance be, you know, for Qvert? What would be, what would we expect to provide you? We might be able to measure that. And, and, and then would, does Qvert add any pressure? Like it would be a question of like, if we're measuring it consistently, we should know if it does, um, at this pressure, you know, if, if, if we, cause I mean, at, at baseline, right, we'll, we'll, we might see it a little bit, but it might not be noticeable, but we'll definitely see it here if Qvert is adding anything, especially as it changes, right? Like as it, between code changes, like you were saying earlier, like if we saw a code change and it had some sort of improvements, we would definitely, anything would be, um, any any improvement would be amplified here mm -hmm. or any, any anything that made it worse would be amplified, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I agree, I agree. So I'm just, you know, I think we should be just careful how, what's the pressure that we put because yeah. some, you know, depends on the pressure, it's not any more Kubernetes components that we see, you know, performance problem. It will be like something else, you know, um, you know, container runtime, Kubelet pressure, things like that, because we are we are already like uh, officially. I don't remember now how how many pods per node Kubernetes officially says that they support. Um, well, the default one is one hundred, isn't it? One hundred ten, and uh, I think the in the document that you showed before, we mm -hmm. see like one hundred. Also, they recommend. Um, you know, OpenShift, it's recommend, it's by default using 200 something. Um, more than that, we are already, you know, beyond the limit. So then we should like be careful. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, 
because maybe we, we will not see what we want to measure. So that's what I'm saying. Especially the Kubevert CI should be something that we control. We know what's happening because the main goal here is to see some change in the code. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I, I think within reason, like I think that's sort of the, the, the limit here is within reason, like we, but a, but a higher pressure job can yield some new information that could be helpful to us. Yeah. I think um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it, I like the the other example. That's really interesting that you showed. Yeah. Okay. I wrote that down. I added that. I think I think it would be cool to see if we can do a high pressure job just to see how, you know, do the yeah. measurements there. Okay. But it, we we see things that it's getting better. For example, here, uh -huh. you know, when in the right request duration, okay. it's like delete, and uh, delete. You know, before, you know, we can see here, uh, what's this date? Uh, not, I don't know, what's this date here? March 5th, that's right. March 5th? Yeah, maybe March 5th, yeah. Okay, no, it's March 5th, okay. So it's March 5th and we see this, uh, you know, delete. The delete was getting like high three seconds. Okay, it depends on the, it was varying. And, uh, yeah, so it would be interesting, Marcel, to see what what happened in the cases that it was. Like that's what I'm wondering here is like, what would cause the delete to be high and what would cause it to be low? You know, because I mean, it, it's possible that between these tests, like there is, it's not, there's probably not code change, or maybe there is, but maybe there isn't. But uh, there also could be, you know, the the way the job is run. Maybe there's something that's different, the pressure has changed in such a way that maybe one of these tipped it over. That could also be the case. Like it, it would be interesting. That's why I was like kind of saying, it would be interesting to know the pressure right when you measure each of these, if there was a way to do that. Um, it would be, it would provide a lot more information than just looking at the graphs. We could have a little bit more than, okay, code has changed. It could be that, oh, wait a second, the pressure has actually changed and maybe it wasn't the code. What do you mean the pressure? So like the pressure, like what I'm saying is that the test that you ran, I mean, I don't know the test that you run here, but let's say that, um, you know, between each of those little bars is a different test. Maybe the cluster in, in each of these tests have um, different numbers of objects. Maybe they've, maybe it's various. And so when you have the higher, maybe those, those bars were the, the thicker it's, ones there for delete. It's it has, not the shit. It's not a shared cluster, it's a dedicated cluster. So it will be always the same. Well, yeah, okay. I mean, I guess I'm just, I'm just proposing a theory, like maybe the pressure is different because like it is possible, like now maybe in your case, that could be the case like with where you're doing it, but it, with any, in any general test, like it would be good to know what the pressure is at rest because we would know that if there is a difference between these two tests, like right, okay. like right, right. The like rest, did... the rest is here. So there, you know, when you see these gaps here, yeah, it is no job. Nothing is running the cluster. So what happens here in the test is, it starts deploys kubevert, run the test, and undeploys kubevert, and then waits hours. You know, I've, it's just running. So each test is just running once a day. Mm -hmm. So then the next day it does the same. So it's it's it takes hours. You know, idle, and the the, and then we have just just two two jobs. One that creates one hundred VMIs, and another one that range 200, 400, 600. So we can do a zoom, for example. You know, one of these tests. Yeah, I, I understand, Marcel. Like, yeah, like you, you have it set up so that it's, there should be, the tests should all be clean in between, right? Yeah, I, I understand. I, all I'm saying is like that, um, it's just another data point. Like that, um, it, it's another data point if you are doing testing in your data center and you're not doing this. You know, if you just want to test at whatever, you know, like you want to know, like as another data point for your test, what the, your pressure was. When you tested it, mm -hmm. yeah, I think so. I think the the tool, you know, that we are writing, it might it can be like many different tests. 
I'm just thinking that maybe the Cooper CI, you know, should shouldn't have like a, too many stress tests, unless it will be a very essential to see some performance, you know, uh, problem that we we want to see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Might be good to have one, but like we yeah, we don't need to have a. I don't think there needs to be a ton of them, but it would, I don't think it'd hurt to have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, yeah, because we were saying like before, you know, a stress test to, to test Kubernetes objects. So, and I, I think those kind of tests shouldn't be in the Kubernetes CI. You know, um, just it should only test the Kubernetes objects. So. We, when you like, yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, we, we should only be testing keyword objects. Yeah. Like, the when we're doing any sort of stress tests. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I completely agree. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Sure. I think that's all. Let me see. I think that's all I have. Yeah. So I wrote down this. This. I mean, this would be good to have at some point. We can talk about this in the future, but I think, I mean, I think we got the topic pretty good. Um, and then, I mean, it's something to think about. I think it's something, it would be interesting to see if this is something we could do. I, I mean, like I said, I, I don't know, like, I don't know if this is quantifiable. It's, it's hard to say, but it would be interesting to know, um, to know that. I, I think it would just bring, it might be a good another data point that we can add when we're, when we're talking about SLOs and we're telling people to go measure their clusters and like something helpful for people. Okay. You know, when when you mean about measure the pressure, yeah, when it's idle, so I mean no pressure, isn't it? So, um, it's just to check like uh, resource usage, this kind of things. There is you mean? Yeah, like um, like how many nodes you have? Like that's a pressure, right? That's a form of pressure. Even if you're at rest, that's still a form of pressure. Like you could have yeah, it will, one... will have some requests, yeah. Right, like you could have one API server and a thousand nodes, and that's that's a bit of pressure. That's quite a bit of pressure for one API server. So, like, there's there's a number of things like that where it would affect your ability to, um, like, it would affect the numbers that you're seeing and the way you test, you know, from the, from what we're what the tools that we have just for people to use the test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's that's basically what I'm saying. It's like um, this is like that information will be helpful. Yeah, it's stability test. If, if, for example, yeah, but yeah, this is hard, but it, it's something that we can think about. For example, if we grant 1000 VMs and just leave there, you know, you, you know, in the long term, does it change anything? You know, what's the pressure? So if the system behaves well, because stability can change, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, that one might be difficult because I mean, maybe we could. I mean, again, it's, it depends how we define pressure. But like, all I was thinking of, like, things that we know define, like, some of the things listed in here, all have different forms of like the number of nodes, the number of pods, mm -hmm. number of PVCs, um, number of namespaces. Um, those I just think like we, those could be numerical values. And then when we're at like during our test, you could measure pressure again. And you could say, uh, you know, now we have a new number of VMs, blah, 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 so on. Our pressure value could change. And based on, you know, like um, the pressure value during the test, you know, we might be able to predict what you would expect for performance just because of the amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. This is an idea. I mean, I think like it really depends because like what I want to get to eventually is like if we can say like our goal is that we can we can say Qver can scale to this number of nodes, right? And how can we do that if um, you know if I mean we could test it right? It's one way. Like we have to get access to a certain amount of nodes, and then we have to run a you know a test again against it, and we probably have to continuously test it. There's some challenges there. But you know that would give us uh, a way to say that okay, it works with this many notes. And the other way, which is what I'm saying here, is like if we knew 
the amount of pressure and their performance. And we, we can get a better idea. We might be able to get a better idea of how well it scales or how well it performs at some at different scales just by a measure of, of pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep thinking about this. Like, I, I think there's a lot to unpack here. So, um, I'll keep thinking about this as maybe something we can talk about in the future as, uh, maybe as I get some, a little bit more clarity on some of the, some of the like different forms of pressure and how it can affect it. But I would, I think what I'll do is I'll probably do a little bit more testing. I wouldn't want to use that steady state job, do a little more testing and kind of continue to form this theory based on, you know, what I see and the results from that, I think is, we will go with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. All right. I don't have any more points. Do you guys have anything else you want to discuss? Yeah. So, um, Raman, I think if it's possible, you know, to put your name in the meetings. Ah, yeah. Yeah. I'll let it. Just because. We see that more people are joining our mission. <laughs> yeah. Roman, uh, you were quiet on some of this stuff. Did you? Do you have any opinion on this of what we were talking about? Um, I I could not share my full attention to the meeting, but I wanted to listen in. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's fine. Okay. The yeah, that's that's all right. We can. The, the TLDR was that um, we we're trying to figure out, um, you know, like a way to measure pressure based on. The number of nodes in a cluster, the number of VMIs, and so on, as a way to to sort of normalize someone's performance, like numbers that they gather, and, and possibly have a way to we could also predict scale or estimate scale, you know, based on someone's, you know, based on someone's pressure or something like. Okay. Mm, yeah, um, you probably mentioned it anyway, but. Um... I mean, we have some, we would see some pressure in general if we have to ask scale and have Prometheus properly deployed, right? So I guess we would just do an hour deployment, ensure that with certain goals we want to meet, we don't see disk pressure or whatever, or is this, but I said, I didn't fully listen. So it may be a little bit off what I'm saying. <laughs> no, yeah, well, like what we, um, yeah, it's mostly like we, we, we want to take is like, it's based on actually this, this a uh, little bit on what I've what we've seen from testing, like Marcelo talked about, like when we see things slow down, when, for instance, when we have, what was it, 500 VMs on a node, Marcelo? Mm -hmm. Like we see like the 400th, 499th VM is a little bit slower than the first. Like the, right, like there's there's a difference there. And, and, and we're trying to see if there's a way to quantify it. Like why is the 499th VM slower? Yeah, um, no. I guess we have a lot of metrics there already. Like you, you, you see how the watches are performing. You're seeing the rate limiters in the clients, right? Yeah. And this is most important to to see if you're hitting some limits there. I guess. But yeah, I mean, we can also maybe miss some. And of course, disk pressure uh, needs to be disk pressure, CPU pressure, and uh, disk pressure, memory pressure needs to be monitored. I guess that are our main entry points from my perspective, at least. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was something that I'll keep thinking about because I think like it would be interesting if there is a way, I, I don't know, like if there is a way to do this, that's sort of, that would work. It's hard to say, like I don't, I'll think about it some more. Okay. All right, do you guys have anything else? I think we're at time here, so I think we'll, we'll end on that then. Okay. All right, guys. So next meeting will be um, in three weeks, April 7th. So I'll be up for three weeks and then uh, I'll return and that'll be our next call. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you,